Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Writing for Your Life interview. This is going to be structured a little bit differently than what we've typically done our interviews. Um, we're going to have Lydia McHale asking questions of Brittany Bergman and myself. And um, in order to kind of give you more of a flavor for who Lydia and Brittany are, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So, Lydia, go ahead. Okay. Um, I am from Chicago. I'm a stay-at-home mom by day, a grad student in counseling by night, and I'm sort of writing in the cracks. I try to write from um, my perspective of um, background in spirituality and um, therapy to write about how we find holiness through wholeness. So I write about sexuality, intentionality, and um, spirituality. Hi, I'm Brittany Bergman. Um, I am also in the suburbs of Chicago. I work full-time as a copy editor at Tyndale House Publishers. I've been there for about six years, and I've been writing online for about six years as well at BrittanyLBergman.com. I write primarily um, personal essays about motherhood and identity transformation and spiritual transformation. And I'll be releasing my first book with Broadleaf um, in August of 2020. It's called Expecting Wonder, and it's about how the physical changes of pregnancy point us toward spiritual and emotional changes as women enter motherhood for the first time. Very cool. Well, that sounds exciting. Congratulations on getting your book deal with Broadleaf. Thank you. Yeah, it's exciting to be part of their inaugural Broadleaf season. Yes, absolutely. Now, they've been doing some wonderful things there, uh, and I've been, you know, working with several of folks there, which I really um, appreciate. Yeah, they're great. So, Lydia, you want to get us started? Sure. Yeah, so um, I think I'll dive in with platform building, um, something I feel like I've seen you do well, Brittany, um, and, but it's also something I think can be really tricky to manage as um, an early stage author uh, trying to figure out your voice, your style, all the things, but then also how to build a platform. So um, hoping you can speak to some of those questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start with, I guess, there's this message out there that now um, building a platform feels like it sort of determines our worth as authors. Um, if you want to publish more traditionally, or even if you just want, if you want your book to go anywhere, even if you do more DIY publishing. So how do you maintain confidence um, if you're not seeing your platform grow very quickly? Yeah. I think we can almost have confidence if our platforms aren't growing quickly. I think that's often a sign of integrity that we're going about our work faithfully. Um, you know, I think about, you know, if we think about a literal platform, something that's built up so that a speaker or a writer or whatever, somebody can be seen and that can facilitate connection you know, you think about a temporary platform, like for a Super Bowl show, it's meant to be built up quickly and torn down. But if we think about these platforms that are built to last, they're built faithfully, they're built with really high quality materials, they're built to last over a long period of time. And that takes a totally different type of work, it takes a different type of focus and intentionality. And so I think if if we think back to those temporary platforms, if that's about visibility almost exclusively, and we think about a more authentic platform as encompassing so much more than visibility, it's also about contribution and connection and resonance. And so I think if we can hit on more than just visibility, we can rest assured that even slow growth is the right growth. That's a really good reframe. Did you, do you feel like you had that mindset this whole time that you were trying to build your platform or it's come over time? Oh, definitely not. It has taken some time. For the first few years that I was writing online, I felt really torn between wanting to focus on the craft of writing and also kind of adjacent to that is blogging, which has a really different feeling and focus. And a lot of writers blog, but you're often going to go about things in different ways. And so I felt a really intense pressure at the beginning to simply grow numbers and then bring the messaging later. And I found that that I almost felt like I was getting burned by that and I wasn't connecting with the people that I ultimately wanted to reach. 
Um, and so that has been a really slow release to let go of that, that drive for numbers, simply for the sake of numbers, to sort of prove, oh, I have something to say because people are following me, and instead I have something to say, and through that I invite people in. Yeah. That sounds like it takes a lot of good inner trust in yourself and your writing. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, it takes a lot of interior interior work. Yeah. Did you want to add anything to that, Brian? Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, uh, this dimension has changed quite a bit over, over you know the few years. When there weren't nearly as many people online, then um, whatever a person was writing, whether it was blogging or on social media or what have you, was more highly seen because there was just fewer people, you know, trying to get our attention. So I think then there was a higher correlation between, you know, a person's writing and, and you know, the quality of that, the attractiveness of that, and how many people were following them. Now I think that those two dimensions are less correlated. Um, and, you know, a person's, as you said, worth, you know, as an author is one thing, but the size and development of your platform is much more dependent upon the particular marketing tactics that you choose to take or not take, particularly advertising. Because in, in today's you know, very crowded, noisy market, it's very difficult to rise above the noise. And so independent of how great a person's writing is, if you don't take those tactical steps, it's just very, very difficult to get anyone's attention and to build awareness about your work. So, you know, I, I view them as more independent now than they used to be. Hmm. Okay, have you, do you have any um, tips on those tactical steps, Brittany, that you've used to rise above the noise? So I think, as Brian said, things are always evolving. And one thing, again, like this information could be outdated in two weeks, but right. what I have found really helpful I think, so a lot of my audience resides on Instagram, and so that's often how I think about this conversation through Instagram in particular, but I think we can, you know, apply some of this to other social media in general, is the way content gets shared is really different now. Before, people were sharing blog links on Facebook, and now people are looking for something really quick that they can share on Instagram. Unfortunately, Instagram in particular has made this easier through stories, but I think we're seeing a shift in sort of like this magazine lifestyle content that was really popular there for a while. And we're starting to see more text graphics and memes and things like that where you can sort of expound on it, but they're very easily shareable. And I feel like that's what's creating the new virality, at least in that slice of social media. And so figuring out how do I take my message and take my heart and take the things that I care about and the, the person that I am as a writer and translate that into this new, almost like a medium within a medium. You know, how do I distill my message in a way that not only connects and resonates with people, but pushes them to share that with others? Because um, that's really the only way it seems to me to get discovered on these platforms is to increase that visibility. But again, without the resonance and the connection, where, you know, where is the, the, the drive for somebody to share that going to come from? So I think in a bigger picture, it just, we continue to evolve and continue to pivot to figure out how, like, how, how do people like to share what I'm saying? Not just do they like what I'm saying, but how can I make it easy for them? How can I make them want to pass this on to their friends? So if I'm hearing this from both of you, it seems like you can, as, a, as a writer or someone trying to grow your platform, you can't just pop on for the platform things, but you also need to be on there trying to figure out how that social media works and what people are doing on it. Yeah, I think so. And I don't want to make it seem like I devote hours a week to thinking about Instagram, but I think when we're engaging authentically with other people who are doing this really well, we naturally just start to notice those things. And so um, I am definitely a perfectionist. I want to know exactly how I'm going to approach something before I even start. 
but I have found social media can be a place where I can also treat it like a playground sometimes and I can experiment with things and the stakes are really low for that. You know, it's not like a submission that I'm sending out to this publication I really want to write for. It's like, it's, it's one post or it's one story. And if it, if it tanks, then I'll just pivot and try something else. Um, and so I think if we can approach social media also with this sense of playfulness, it can really take the pressure off and we can just see what works, see what resonates. Um, and sometimes when we make one of those pivots, it can take a while because our, our audience has come to expect certain things from us. And so um, it might take them a while to kind of get into whatever new thing we're doing. But I think if we can, yeah, approach it with some creativity and playfulness, um, it just creates that that space for us to explore and and make those turns without feeling such a pressure to keep up with the times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like authenticity is really important here. As long as you're showing up as yourself, even if you're experimenting or whatever, that that people will come along with you if you're if you're being because they're there to to like see, be with who you are, kind of. Yeah, and it's like we should maybe only be changing by a couple degrees at a time, right? Yeah, like sure. I'm not going to suddenly do a text graphic on, I don't know, vegan eating and kids because that's not anything that, you know, that my readers would never, ever expect that from me. Right. But I could change, you know, like one thing. I could try a text graphic about the things I already talk about, or I could try a photo with a caption about something that's maybe, you know, slightly different from what I usually talk about. But, um, I think part of the key is to kind of evolve slowly so that we can bring people along with us. Yeah, those are all really good tips, thanks. I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense from what I've seen too, I mean, consistency is very important, you know, and kind of being uh, consistent with your brand and your persona and your messaging is really good. But at the same time, experimentation is essential, you know, and, and trying new things to see how they, they play out. I, I think and getting feedback from that is really important. But also, you know, you do have some control over the different things that people see. In other words, you know, you can, you can um, experiment more in areas that don't affect your existing audience base, for instance. You know, you can experiment on other platforms, like, for instance, if Instagram is where a lot of your um, <clears throat> primary audiences, then, you know, maybe experiment more on some of the other platforms or experiment in your advertising. If you're gonna be spending money on advertising, um, you know, the purpose of that is to attract new followers, not to speak to your existing followers. Mm -hmm. So it's easier, I think, if you're doing that, to try different things and focus, you know, on a broader set of um, formats. Whereas, you know, with your audience, then I think, you know, you want to feed them with what they expect, right? I mean, you want to nourish them with what they love to see from you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there's a baby crying in the background. I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, oh, I know. Okay, so um, if you're trying to be more, I think, intentional, authentic about what you're putting out there in the areas maybe where you're not experimenting, how do you manage that amount of content? I, like you, Brittany, I think I'm more of a perfectionist and I want every post to be so precise. I want to know exactly my plan and my goals before I even start trying to build a platform. So how have you, um, what have you done to try to like manage good content? Because I, I also hear that we need to be very consistent about being on social media and that's where I think I struggle. Yeah, and I, th I think I used to think of consistency as posting seven days a week at exactly the optimal time. And I don't think that that's exactly the kind of consistency we're going for. Like, yes, you have to be present in the places where your audience is regularly, but that doesn't mean every single day. And not every post has to be the most thoughtful, knock it out of the park post. Like sometimes it can be enough to just pop your head in and say, hey, I'm here, you know, here like with a one or two sentence caption, as long as whatever image or text or whatever you're sharing is still on brand, for lack of a better term. And I think a lot of the consistency can come forth in those intangibles, in your messaging, in what you choose to talk about, 
in even the way you style an image or the commentary you offer before you share a link. Um, those are all part of consistency. I think we can also put healthy boundaries around it. It doesn't mean that we have to be attached to our phones 24 hours a day. It means that when we're on whatever social media platform that we're engaging really intentionally. And so when we open up that app, we're scrolling the hashtags looking for, you know, new people to connect with, or we're responding to people who have commented on our posts or we're commenting on other people's posts and creating sort of that reciprocal cycle of feedback because consistency isn't just, I shoot my message out to the world, you know, mm -hmm. X days a week at, at X time, mm -hmm. but it's, I'm a consistent presence here. I contribute consistently. I encourage consistently. I connect consistently. Mm -hmm. And those are all things that make you a presence and not just a voice, if that makes sense. Yeah, it sounds like that experimentation can be really important for figuring out like what exactly your voice and your presence is because that's what you need to keep bringing. Yeah. The only other thing I would add to that is one way to help with the consistency and also kind of like having the, the mix of formats that you want is to schedule some of your posts in advance. Yeah. Um, which, you know, gives you a kind of a baseline to build upon. So you can still be, you know, ad hoc and do lots of engagement and other kinds of posts on top of that baseline. But at least, you know, if you've got the things that you want to make sure that are out there, whether it's a blog post or a meme or a video or whatever, um, and, and, and you've scheduled the mix of those that you want to have per month, then it kind of, you know, takes the pressure off a little bit, I think, in terms of, you know, having to always be present, you know, mm -hmm. kind of in your, ad, quote, unquote, ad hoc form. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that's such a great way to create consistency, like just at a, pr a very practical level. When I'm on my game, I, you know, I've, I've kind of distilled down to the four to five types of posts that I typically share on, again, for example, Instagram, you know, I might share a thoughtful post about motherhood, like a, maybe a longer caption. I might do something short and sweet. I might share a meme or a poem or something else that I've written. And then I try to leave one or two spaces flexible for, you know, whatever comes up that week that is, you know, a thought or maybe an introductory post if I have some new followers. And so by color coding all that and plugging it in, I can see kind of how I want the weeks to flow. And so I still have the flexibility to talk about timely things, but I can also make sure that I'm putting in front of people the variety of content that I want them to engage with. And then that takes the pressure off me every day from saying, what am I going to post today? I had 17 thoughts yesterday and I don't remember any of them. And yeah. so that helps me to stay consistent because the, the ideation is the hardest part for me. Once I know, I don't have to have the caption pre-written, but if I know generally what I wanted to say, it's easy to just pound out that caption and then post the photo. But I will say, you know, social media takes as long as it takes. Like a lot of work goes into crafting a thoughtful post. And so for a long time, I thought I was doing it wrong, that it could take me, you know, 20 minutes to write a micro essay, 30 minutes, and then the time it takes to edit the photo, gather the hashtags, even though I have those saved to my phone, like finding the right ones or whatever, that there's a lot of thought and intentionality that goes into it. And so it, it looks effortless. It looks like we just put this post together and there it is. But if you're sitting there wondering, am I doing it wrong that it takes me this long to post on social media? I just want to assure you, you're not you're not doing it wrong. Like, and I think maybe this is diving into a different topic, but sometimes I don't think about social media as being my real writing, mm -hmm. but it is because I'm putting forth that intentional thought and I'm putting forward my authentic voice. And so all of it is practice. All of it is real. And so when I start giving it the weight that it deserves, not to put pressure on myself to be a social media maven, but instead to say, no, this is real writing. Like people receive this, people learn from this, people appreciate this, then that 
gives me the fuel to be able to put the type of intentionality into it that feels good. Mm -hmm. I think those are really helpful reframes. I think a lot of early stage authors, me included, do that where I think I struggled with how long it was taking me and like, does this really matter? This is, this is taking away from the point. Um, and I think hearing lots of things and from both of you has helped to reframe that. Even in our, um, Brian's recent uh, Business of Being a Spiritual Writer conference, he talked about how authors spend 50% of their writing time on this platform building stuff and on the, and the other half on writing. And, I think that was so helpful for me to hear in numbers and be like, okay, good, because it's taking me that long to, like you said, post an intentional craft or craft an intentional post. Yeah. Um, I would love to dive more into this with both of you, if you wouldn't mind, just some more of those like logistical things for how you, um, how you streamline this process or, or organize it all. Cause I know just talking to several people who just came from your conference, Brian, we're feeling overwhelmed now with the amount of stuff we need to do. And we're, we're just still stuck trying to make a plan. So like, what, do you have any, any little practical tips, like how you schedule, how you color code, um, if you set timers for how long you're, you're scrolling through hashtags or things like that? Yeah, so like I mentioned, I have that color coded planning spreadsheet. I just, you know, made it myself in Google Sheets. And so whenever I have an idea, if I'm near my computer, I'll, I usually have that spreadsheet open in a tab all the time and I can just plug it in. Um, if not, I'll jot it down on my phone so I don't forget for later. Um, and I try to tackle social media first thing in the morning because otherwise it's going to kind of nag at my brain the rest mm -hmm. of the day. And I find that, um, again, I don't have a set time that I try to post, but I find that a lot of moms typically are engaged in Instagram first thing in the morning. And so I try to get that out before lunchtime. And then I don't have to really think about it too much the rest of the day. I can pop on, respond to comments, um, you know, scroll through other people's posts. But I try to set a rule for myself that if I open the Instagram app or Facebook or whatever, that I'm going to find five things to comment on so that I can make sure that I'm not just getting sucked into the drain of scrolling, but that I'm actually doing something useful and encouraging to somebody else. Yeah, that's a good thing to think about. Well, I want to uh, go back to what, what Brittany said a moment ago about, you know, the fact that what we're doing online is real, just as real as your writing. Because if you step back a moment, what's the reason for writing a book in the first place? It's to impact people, mm -hmm. right? And until 15 years ago, that's the main way we had to impact people. Now we have this additional way to impact people called social media. So, yeah, it's a different format, but if the whole point is to impact people, then let's use the tools that we can do that best with, right? Whatever they are. So uh, for me, I think, you know, the, the writing in this new form and the creativity that it allows is actually just as important <laughs> as writing in, you know, the traditional book form. Yeah. Um, but in any event, back to, you know, your question, Lydia, about tools. I mean, you know, I think, you know, whether it's a color coded spreadsheet or other kinds of online documents or, or your schedule itself, I mean, I know personally, the more I can organize myself kind of in advance, you know, up front, whatever it is I'm trying to do, the easier it is to try to execute it later on then, mm -hmm. when you're busy, you know, or, or hit from multiple sides with different things going on. Yeah. I think these yeah. questions, oh, sorry, go ahead, Brittany. Oh, I was just going to mention one other tool, um, because I feel like with with Facebook, we don't really have to think about it so much, but with Instagram, there's also this added pressure of making sure that when somebody clicks over to your profile, it looks accessible and pretty and aesthetically pleasing. And so it's not just am I sharing a variety of content sort of in this pattern, you know, in this rhythm and this pattern that I want it to, but do the photos look nice together? Does everything look cohesive? And so I think there's some tools that can help us with that. I use a planning app called Unum. There's one called Planoly. There's tons of them out there where you can upload your photos to the app and kind of like rearrange your grid until you get it to where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so finding that balance of both, am I sharing a variety of content across the week, but am I sharing images that feel right and that look, that look nice together, that will, will look good if somebody stumbles across my profile and they're making that decision about whether or not they want to follow me. Mm -hmm. So that can be, those can be helpful tools too. Um, I don't do too much with scheduling. Um, I don't 
honestly post enough to need an actual scheduler, but something that helps me to think and prepare in advance is really helpful. Yeah, I actually do schedule even though I post maybe, well, the ideal would be like one or two times a week, but like you, it helps me not to like noodle on it for too long. If I just can like get two weeks of content ready to go and then not think about it until I hop on to comment or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, which is I, what I was going to say is I think that these questions are important um, for spiritual writers, I think, because as spiritual people, we're also paying attention to the way we're impacted by social media. And I think that's why like part of this process is answering those boundary questions um, about like how, how spending this much time on social media is affecting us, even though it is a really important tool for connecting. It's new. And I mean, for me personally, I haven't, I don't really, didn't really use social media until trying to build a platform. So I think there's this whole other undercurrent of questions I'm answering as well. Um, okay, so one more question on um, this is for, I guess for mostly for Brittany, but I know that your um, writing style is more personal. So how do you balance um, what's kind of what goes with your brand, what you're willing to share, and what's just for you? Yeah. I don't have a specific delineation where it's like, okay, X, Y, and Z topics are off limits, but A, B, and C are okay. It's more just a feeling, I don't know if we want to call it intuition or whatever, where it feels like, I feel like I just know when I want something to be for me. And so I'll talk about, like, I'll be an open book on social media and I'll be honest and authentic with whatever I bring, but that doesn't mean that I share absolutely everything. And so I try to remember that being honest and authentic and online doesn't mean that people know the ins and outs of 100% of my life. It means that I'm honest and authentic about the slice of life that I'm choosing to share. And so again, I don't have hard and fast rules about what I will and won't share, but if it feels weird to me in the moment, or it's, you know, if I get this sense that like, am I going to regret sharing this maybe five, 10 years down the road? What might my kids think of this? Um, I try to play that out as a thought experiment in my mind, or if I just feel the pull to be present in a moment and enjoying it where I am, instead of trying to capture the meaning right away or capture the image right away. Um, I, I'll try to just tune into that and say, okay, this is a moment that's just for me to enjoy as a human and not as a content creator. Um, I think over time, we've also had this shift on social media where there's sort of like these unwritten rules about what we're sharing and what we're not at any given time, sort of as a culture, not necessarily as an individual. And so for a while it was, it was a highlight reel. Like it's, we're only sharing the positive, only sharing the good stories, only sharing the good moments. And then it kind of swung into, well, we only need to share the messy and the raw and the real to combat that highlight reel that social media became. And I think it's okay if we're somewhere in the middle of that. And so personally, my goal is always to be helpful, contribute something that doesn't just add to the noise, but actually helps and to create connection with the people I'm serving. And so even if I share something that's really personal and difficult, even a little bit raw, maybe I'm still processing it, um, which reminds me of the, you know, kind of the old rule that don't share anything that you're still processing. Sometimes I do share something that I'm still processing if I think it'll be of service to somebody else and I don't feel like it will hinder my own processing and healing from that. So if it has the potential to do those things, to be helpful, to contribute something that's more than just noise and to create connection and resonance for somebody else, then I'll generally go ahead and share it. Those are my good guidelines. <laughs> Did you have anything to add, Brian? No, I would just say that this is one of those things that's incredibly dependent upon your audience and, you know, kind of the space in the market that you're occupying. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think the things that Brittany's talking about are more and more coming into the fore right, and, and, and becoming more pervasive. But, you know, if your, your, your message and your theme and your topic is more, I want to say, academic, you know, or intellectual or, you know, quote, unquote, serious, <laughs> if you know what I mean, um, then I think where you draw those lines differs. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if all, this is kind of sw- switching gears to more the publishing process, but um, if, if, you know, all of this is hopefully leading to getting published or writing a book, um, at what, I guess, is there a certain number we hope to get to before we start that process? Or, or I guess, at, like, at what point do you know you're ready to begin seeking publication? Hmm. So I know the number that often gets thrown around in publishing circles is 10,000. And we don't always <laughs> define what that means. Is that 10,000 people on one social channel, combined social channels, on each social channel? Um, and I think there's a lot of focus in getting to this 10,000 follower mark. Um, and that's not to say that there's not a current, like there's definitely truth in that. I think if you have at least 10,000 followers as a baseline, it's much easier to get the ear of an agent or the ear of a publisher. Like it's easier to be heard. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I also don't think that that's necessarily means that you're not ready to seek publication until you have reached that number. There's other benchmarks that we can consider. Um, and I say that not as like, I'm like, this much part of the gatekeeping in my job. Like I'm a copy editor. I'm usually seeing something well after it has been accepted by my publishing house. But I know that some of the very best books I've ever worked on have come from authors with super small social media followings, far less than 10,000 followers when they got their contracts. And it's because there's so much more that goes into it than the number of followers you have, though that does help. You know, it it is a selling point. It does, you know, it does give publishers confidence in the number of books that you can sell and the number of people you can reach. So I don't want to say that it's not important because it is, but it is not the only factor. Um, I can go more into that, but I can also make space for for you, Brian. Well, what I was going to say is uh, um, that whole parameter differs widely depending on the publishing house Mm -hmm. right you know so the big five you know quote unquote the bigger publishing houses are looking for bigger authors with bigger platforms they're going to sell bigger contracts and that's what all the agents are looking for too because the agents make money as a percentage of the advance on royalties so um, there's that part of the market and i think you know a ten thousand number i mean although many people are not willing to actually quantify like that Um, I think it's more important Mm -hmm. for those larger publishing houses. As you get into the mid and smaller range of um, publishing houses, I think it matters less. Um, Not that it doesn't matter, but I think that they are my experience and, and, you know, hearing from lots of other authors, but um, they're much more open to uh, quote unquote, taking a risk, right. Or, (laughs) or, or working with someone who maybe has many other promising factors in play um, beyond just their social media numbers, for instance. And then the, I think the other part of this, to mention this too, is what has the author done already, right? If they've already published, you know, some books with a, um, you know, small or mid-sized publishing house or even self-published, um, and those have been relatively successful given, you know, what they have in terms of platform and everything else, I think that's a good indicator to a publishing house too. Absolutely. And I heard an agent talk one time, I think, I don't know if this is her analogy in particular, but I think the first time I heard it was from Jenny Burke on a podcast where she talks about our platform and especially like not just platform expansively, but platform maybe as we think about the platform section of a book proposal, like really practically and really specifically um, consists of three, three things. Um, it's the number of social followers that you have, or I guess, so this isn't so much platform as it is what a publishing house or what an agent is looking for. They're looking for that platform, which is sort of the number of people who follow you, but also engagement. And there's also writing ability. You know, do you have the skill and the talent to, you know, to write something beautiful and readable and resonant. And then it's also your idea um, for that particular book. Is it a relevant idea? Is it timely? 
is it just different enough? Like, is it, is it in the market enough that we know people are going to read it and buy it and be hungry for it? But is it different enough from what's already out there? And so those are all factors that go into any publication decision by an agent or a, a publishing house. And we need at least two of those legs generally to be really, really strong. And so while we can work on our weakest leg, and I think it's important that we do, I think it's equally important that we lean into our strengths um, and know that there, there can be supports for where we're a little bit weaker. Um, and so when we think more specifically about platform, especially in that book proposal context, it's so much more than just the number of people who are following us on social media or who are reading our blogs or, you know, like the, the number of people who come through our website every day. It's going back to that visibility connection and resonance. What are you already doing? Like, where is your audience hanging out? Where are they already living? Where are they already consuming? And how are you meeting them there? And so it's a lot harder to quantify those sorts of other things because I don't have, you know, a follower count that I can give. But, you know, did you have a pin that went viral about a specific topic that is related to the book that you're proposing? Do you write for a website as a regular contributor or have you had guest posts accepted in places where your audience is already hanging out? Um, have you had content reshared on, you know, a big website or a big, you know, a big content creator on their social media? Do they, do they see what you're doing and think this is valuable to our shared audience and I'm going to share it too? Those are all pieces that make up your platform that go so far beyond your social media numbers because it shows that what you're doing is resonating with other people so much so that somebody's willing to take a risk and share your content on their site or their profile or their channel. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we can also consider part of our expansive platform. Yeah, it is really hard to quantify. That's a good point because I feel like there's there's sometimes someone could have a, a bunch of numbers, but those people just scroll through their stuff and you could have a small amount of numbers, but like everything you, you post, they open. I mean, that, I think that goes a long way too. Absolutely. Did you want to jump in, Brian? No, no, I'm good. Okay. Um, all right. Well then I think this is actually a question for both of you. Thinking of that three legged stool you mentioned, Brittany, what would both of you say to a, an early stage author who is just really struggling that weakest stage is the platform building whether it's because they just struggle with the skills of whatever using using the different social media channels or graphic design or that maybe they don't have the financial ability to pay for advertisement like what are the options left for them um, in this day and age can, can they be a writer do they need to go diy what would you say to them mm, that's a good question I think I would say lean into the other legs and let those be your guide in terms of building a platform. You know, I wonder if part of the reason for feeling like you're kind of floundering a little bit on social media, like, are you clear on the message? Are you clear on your writing craft? And how can you use those to bolster the platform instead of maybe just chasing numbers for the sake of numbers? Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of this comes down to identifying your strengths as a writer, and then that can be our guide in terms of who we're trying to reach and how. Um, and then from there, again, there's just so many tools at our disposal for how we can make life easier on ourselves. Like, there's so many free apps. I, I have found that it's a very rare situation where I need to go for the paid version of something. You know, I use the free version of Canva, which I am not a graphic designer, but Canva makes me feel like I am. Right. So using the free version of tools like Canva to design these sorts of graphics that you're seeing on social media, especially on Instagram and designing pins and even just resizing things for Facebook, you know, um, to make sure that, again, like cross promotion is your friend. You're you're pouring so much time and effort into, you know, creating an Instagram post or creating a tweet. 
why wouldn't you go ahead and repurpose that for the other social media platforms? And then maybe even for an email newsletter or a blog post, like we don't have to worry too much about um, being repetitive because the chances are good that we're encountering different people on each different platform where we're sharing. Mm -hmm. And even if, you know, the people who subscribe to an email newsletter are the same people who follow us on Instagram, probably fewer of them because of the nature of email newsletters, like because of social media algorithms and people's attention spans, I think it's okay if people are getting the same messages from us in slightly different formats multiple times. So, um, you know, what I would say, Lydia, you know, the absolute most important step number one is, as Brittany was saying, the messaging. And, um, you know, as we talked about during the seminar, I mean, the first place that needs to be embodied is your elevator pitch and your tagline. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like, who are you trying to help? What problem are you trying to help them solve? And, you know, what, what is your solution? You know, what are you offering to them to help deal with that issue? And really nailing that in a succinct and compelling way, I think, is table stakes for any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after that, I mean, I think it's, it's a question of prioritizing your tactics. You know, I mean, a website, I think, is table stakes. Everyone's got to have a, a good-looking, you know, website because that's mm – -hmm what people are going to go look for. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what's your social media channel of choice that you want to try to be um, engaged in and active in the most. And, you know, as Brittany said, for her, it's Instagram for, you know, other people, it's other channels. There's no right or wrong other than, you know, what's the most likely place for your audience to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's the most likely, ch you know, channel for you to be able to reach them. So those are kind of the three the three things I would recommend to anyone, yeah. you know, in terms of trying to deal with the overwhelming nature of this. Number one is nail your message. Number two is make sure you have a good, nice looking website. Number three, you know, get started on whichever social media or or maybe it's speaking. I mean, I mean, I mean it's not even social media. I mean, there are other choices. Maybe it's podcasting. Yeah. But whatever your avenue of choice is, just try to go nail that. Yeah. Sounds like focus is really important and finding that clarity of who you are so people know who it is they're following and Absolutely. More lean into investing in that social media and platform part, the better it's going to go. Absolutely. And I think sort of level two with this is not only finding our audience on, you know, which channel is our audience typically living on or engaging with, but where are other writers or speakers or podcasters or, you know, lowercase i influencers, <laughs> where, where are they? Because that might be different where perhaps, you know, your audience lives on Instagram. Maybe your fellow creators in that same genre are actually communicating with each other on Twitter. And so figuring out not just how do I connect with readers, but how do I connect with other people who are doing what I'm doing online so that I can learn from them, so that I can connect with them, so that we can support each other, so that you have that network of people that you're already connected with, because that's important to publishing too. Um, we share each other's books, we share each other's articles, we, you know, like we rely not just on an audience, but on a community of fellow creators and creatives. And so I think that's sort of the next level of platform building is making sure that you have that network of support and knowing that those you might be finding that slice of your platform in a slightly different place than maybe you're finding your audience. Yeah, that's important. Okay, so um, back to publishing for a minute. Um, do you have any tips or practices um, for authors who might be ready to start pitching even maybe with a smaller platform, but they're feeling intimidated by the process? Yeah, I think one tip that has served me well through this is to remember that the people who are sitting on the other side of the desk or the pitch meeting or the cold email that you just sent are humans like you and they're doing their jobs they're looking for the next person to sign they're hoping that your message is the one that's going to resonate with their audience too and so while i personally felt really intimidated by 
the gatekeepers of sorts, because if we're pursuing traditional publishing, there are, there are some gatekeepers. Um, and they are coming to the table with, with some power, a different type of power than we bring. But they're hoping to go back to their publishing house or their agency, having found the next voice that they're going to work with, the next person that they think can encourage their readers or listeners. And so I think if we remember that whoever we're pitching to, whoever we're seeking to work with is also looking for a collaborator and a partner and a voice and a person and not necessarily a new cog for their machine, it goes a long way in building our own confidence and also connecting at that human level first rather than at that transactional level. And of course, all of social media is and blogging and you know, submitting to websites, that's all an exercise in connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds like keeping the humanity in mind through all of this is so important. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add is try to get as much feedback as you can from either more experienced authors or, um, you know, consultants that you can hire, you know, to review a book proposal, for instance, or, you know, just discuss, you know, where you're at. Um, or editors or literary agents, but you know, um, get feedback, get input. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think it's ever money poorly spent. You know, you never know when you're buying a, an e course or something if it's really going to be worth what you're paying. I think hiring a good editor to give you feedback, especially at the proposal level, is never going to be a waste. Good to know. Speaking of that, how did you? decide to go with um, traditional versus self-publishing? Well, I work in traditional publishing and absolutely love it. And so I knew that what I wanted most was to work, or at least for my, you know, shifting to my author side, I wanted to also work with a traditional publisher. And self-publishing is a really, you know, viable and good option. But I think you have to be ready to take on that level of commitment in a way that I wasn't. It's already a ton of work and a ton of creative energy to write a book. And then self-publishing adds a whole extra layer, more than one extra layer in terms of you're having to find your own editor, your own graphic designer for the interior and the cover. You're having to get technical with Amazon and book distributors and you know, formatting the ebook and all of these things, which I personally knew that I didn't have the time or the patience to figure out, and I didn't have the will to figure it out. And so I feel like sort of the myth that we hear a lot is that you give up complete control of your book and your message if you go with a traditional publisher. But really, I see it more as a trade off. Like I was willing to relinquish a little bit of control to have all the benefits that come with a traditional publishing house. So sure, I, you know, gave up some control of my cover and my design and I, you know, was willing to work with an editor and shape it in the direction that they thought would be best for their publishing house. Um, <laughs> but I also got so much in terms of support without me having to both go to the effort and the expense of hiring that sort of help for myself and then hoping I would recoup the cost with my sales. And so I think the key there though is really doing the work to find an agent or a publishing house that's gonna be the best fit, not just for your book, but for you as an author and making sure that whichever way you go, you know, whether you're self-publishing or traditional publishing, that the people you bring onto your team, the people who you join with to, you know, to partner to bring this book into the world, really get what you're trying to do. And so I don't mean to say that we're not open to feedback because I think feedback is really important. You know, publisher feedback, editor feedback is so important because they know readers. That's their, that's their job is to make sure that our work sounds like us and is the best version of what we can produce and is also going to reach as many people as possible in the way that they need to be reached. But if it feels like what you're being asked to do with your book just isn't 
it isn't something that you're willing to do, it isn't a direct a direction you're willing to go, that's okay too. And you can keep trying to find a place that's going to be a good fit for, for you and for a particular project. So as a practical example, when I was shopping my first book around, um, I got some feedback from one publisher who loved the idea as it was, sort of as a memoir about a first-time pregnancy told through short, you know, shorter chapters essay form. And then another publisher who came back and said that they love the overarching idea, but they want it to be more of a self-help hybrid with lots of guided application questions throughout, kind of like a, a workbook self-help spiritual living hybrid. And that just wasn't what I was trying to accomplish. And I think that would reach two very different audiences. Um, and so I knew that what I wanted was to pursue more of the memoir format and less of the workbook self-help format. Um, and that doesn't mean that that feedback wasn't valuable. It has given me tons of ideas for how I could maybe repurpose and expand my content. But I think getting clear on what you want out of a book and then what are the things you're willing to compromise on, what are the things you're willing to let go of control of can help you kind of make that decision about whether to go with traditional or self-publishing. Thank you. That's helpful. Did you want to jump in, Brian? I know you offer a lot on <laughs> those topics. Well, I mean, the bottom line, I think, you know, that I tell most folks is that if you can get a really good publishing partner, you know, great editor, um, go for it, you know, because you're going to learn so much and you're, they're going to bring a lot of value to the table to support, you know, an author's efforts. Um, but just know that if that avenue doesn't pan out, you've got a very good backup alternative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I find so, so much relief in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's well worth it to try to build a, a partnership with a, with a strong traditional publisher, not necessarily a hybrid publisher. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, is, some of them are great and some of them are not so great. So, you know, I, I, would, I would favor either you know, going with a traditional publisher, and if you can't, then do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Helpful. All right, well, one last practical question about publishing from both of you, if you have things to say on it, would be how much would you, like financially, how much would you expect um, or suggest for an early stage author to plan on investing in advertisements and paying for um, editors or literary agents? or even, even little apps, I guess, to help <laughs> run everything. Any tips on that? I honestly find this really hard to quantify. That's, I mean, of course, it's going to be so different for everyone. And um, I will say that personally, I have always, I've just, I've spent more than I've made writing. And I'm okay with that. And I can say that from a really privileged position that I can sort of treat it as a hobby in one way because you know we we pour money into a hobby we you know hobbies are typically not free even if you're just out there running every day you know you're buying shoes you're buying clothes to wear and so i can think about it in that way but then i can also think of it as an investment account that um the money that i pour into my writing will hopefully gain me not necessarily money in the future although that's nice when we get paid for our, our creative work, but also opportunities. And so I think we just have to approach it in a really thoughtful way about what's going to be most important to you. And I think that has to do, you know, with so much of, you know, the three-legged stool and the strengths that we bring to the table and where are we weakest, where are we strongest, because there, there's just no, no end to the number of ways we could invest in ourselves. There's professional memberships, there's online classes, there's conferences, there's, you know, virtual assistants for social media, editors and scheduling services and all the things. And so I think asking those questions, coming back to where is my audience living? Where am I struggling to reach them? Where do I need to reach them more? And what's going to give me the most bang for my buck in terms of my own learning and development? And so that might look different in different seasons of your writing too. You know, as you get closer to being ready to pitch to an agent or an editor, money spent going to conferences is gonna be a great investment for you because you're going to learn and you're going to network. And 
you know, you're going to have the opportunity to meet with people who can give you that feedback and possibly open some doors. Um, you know, hiring an editor for a book proposal, always a great idea. But if you've already gotten the feedback that your social following is too low, you know, just, just not where it needs to be to get that traditional book deal and you still really want to go that way, then investing in some, you know, some social media scheduling tools and some classes to help you learn how to use those could also be a great fit. So it just, it depends so much where you are, who you're trying to reach and what strengths you already bring to the table. Um, it is absolutely one of those kinds of things that's impossible to quantify because every situation is different. But, you know, having said that, um, for many folks, you know, at least assuming a couple thousand dollars, right, you know, in terms of conferences, in terms of editors and, you know, um, advertising mm -hmm. um, to build your platform, I, I think is, you know, something that many people sh should be prepared for. If, in addition to that, you decide to take the self-publishing route, I mean, as we've talked about, that's money up front that you spend as opposed to, you know, a traditional route where you're getting a royalty instead. So there's money coming in in that case as, as opposed to money going out. So there's more of an upfront cost associated with self-publishing. But um, there's more downstream royalty, at least percentage of, of your book's, you know, sales will come more to uh, an independent published author. And more generally speaking, um, you know, in terms of like the whole profit and loss statement, I mean, if, if you can leverage your book into making money in other ways, whether it's speaking, whether it's teaching, whether it's editing yourself or, or uh, consulting or freelance writing or whatever, um, you know, there, there's opportunities beyond just the book royalties to uh, hopefully, you know, build a business and make up for whatever investment you put into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was a good, um, a good way of thinking about it too, Brittany, as sort of like a hobby and investing money in a hobby. I think that's a good. All right, the last question is um, just one on balance. Speaking of the hobby thing, I think a lot of early stage authors aren't um, making a career out of their writing. It is sort of more in the cracks of life, or you know, they're balancing it with their main job or their parenting or whatever. Um, so do either of you have some practical tips on how you balance it, especially when, you know, it's, it's not just writing anymore. It's half of it is building the platform and learning and researching and the other half is writing. Yeah. Sometimes it can get frustrating because it feels like what I need to do to be as faithful as I could possibly be to my own writing and that side of my career, as I have, I've come to think of it more as the second part of my career and not just a hobby anymore. And of course that took time, but I could give a full-time, you know, number of hours to that and still feel like I wasn't being quite faithful enough. But then I also have an actual full-time job and kids. And um, that makes it really hard because I, I so much want, I have this inner drive to compartmentalize everything. And I think that's what we are kind of talking about when we talk about balance. Like, how do I compartmentalize everything neatly enough and then give it equitable amounts of space? And instead, I'm trying to think of the writing part of my career. Like, yes, there are tasks that I need to just sit down and get done and treat it a little bit like a job. But if I'm living a creative life, then that spills over into everything that I'm doing. And so if maybe I'm in a season where I'm not producing as much content as I want to or that I feel like I should be doing, um, one, that can be a problem if you're working on a deadline or on a book contract. But if you're sort of free in that way, trying to think about writing in sort of like different buckets, you know, is it a hobby? Is it a creative outlet? Is it your way of resting? Is it a processing tool? Is it this creative need that you have? Is it a job? And on good days, we can think about our writing as something that helps us to show up more fully to all the other parts of our lives. And so when we choose not to compartmentalize that creative part of ourselves, then everything in life is writing. Everything is fodder for writing. And so while I, I sort of resist thinking about, you know, 
living my life and enjoying my kids and, you know, just going out and doing normal things. I don't want to think of that as a transactional way and that I'm always mining it for content. But I also know that a huge part of the writing life is the interior world and our observations. Um, again, not just how do I turn this into content, but noticing details, looking for connections, looking for humanity and universality in whatever moment we're in wrestling with meaning and then sharing that with others, that is the task of a writer. And so, you know, that's what also we're built to do as humans. When we're sitting around a dinner table, we're sharing stories with one another. That's what we do with our friends. That's how we build a meaningful life. And so I think if we can learn to think of all of our life as writing and all of our life as creativity, it can make that feel a little bit easier in seasons when it feels like we're not necessarily producing as much as we want to, which I think is part of the tension in wanting to feel balance in this is um, it, a lot of times it actually, when we boil it down, it's about production. And so if we think about it in terms of creativity, for me, that really helps. Yeah, that is very helpful. <laughs> And I also always come back to, I think it was Liz Gilbert in Big Magic, perhaps, where she said that she, it took her a long time, it took her a ton of success to be willing to quit her day job, not because she couldn't support herself in writing, which is, of course, a big concern. It's very hard to support yourself in writing alone, but because she didn't want to put that kind of pressure on her creativity. And so sometimes I wonder you know, when I start to get discouraged and feeling like I wish I could devote more time to my writing, it helps me to remember that I'm not prepared to ask my writing to support me yet. And that's okay. And that having those boundaries, having to get creative about when I do my creative work, sometimes allows for a flourishing that if I had a whole day of childcare and nothing but writing to do, you know, maybe that in itself would stifle my creativity. And so I think we can embrace whatever season we're in, um, knowing that the hard boundaries we're up against might actually be for our flourishing and not for our detriment. Yeah, that's a really helpful way to end. <laughs> Thank you. Did you want to jump in, Brian? Well, I really can't because I'm not a writer. <laughs> and, you know, I'm trying to juggle lots of different things, but... Um, you know, it's more a question of prioritization for me. And my calendar is what drives my prioritization from a practical perspective. So I use that heavily to prioritize the different things I'm doing. But I'm not trying to be a writer. So it's a much different situation. Yeah. Well, that's all I have. That, I thought that was extremely helpful. Thank you both so much. <laughs> Thanks for your questions, Lydia. They were yeah. fantastic. Good. <laughs> They're real ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you both for taking the time to, to do this. I'm sure that it's going to be really helpful for uh, all of our audience. So appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Brian, for coordinating. <laughs>